spends time each evening reading a small selection of the torrent of letters that pour into the White House daily. Obama probably worked out for himself that wise leaders keep alive their personal connections with the ordinary public. But it's likely that in this, as elsewhere, he sees himself in step with the presidential, pre with the presidential predecessor he most admires, Abraham Lincoln. For during his tenure of the executive mansion, Lincoln aimed to keep himself fully informed and grounded. He remarked that, and I quote, men moving only in an official circle are apt to become merely official, not to say arbitrary in their ideas, and are apter and apter to forget that they only hold part in a representative capacity. So we had his secretaries sift a few dozen representative letters from the mountain of daily correspondence from the public. And he held what he called public opinion bars, twice weekly meetings where every applicant for audience took his turn, as Lincoln put it, as if waiting to be shaved in a barber's shop. Lincoln concluded that no hours of my day are better employed than those which bring me again within the direct contact of the average of our whole people. Well, the 16th president has, in effect, been a model for the 44th. In 2005, as Obama walked the streets of Illinois uh, in the state capitol, before speaking at the dedication of the Lincoln Library and Museum, he, and I quote, started wondering whether the poor boy born in the backwoods of Kentucky ever dreamed that a presidential library would be dedicated in his name, or that it was possible for a black man to speak at that dedication as a United States senator. As a junior U.S. Senator from Illinois, Obama often jogged down to the Lincoln Memorial and silently mouthed the words carved in marble, Gettysburg Address, and the second inaugural. And when in 2007 he announced his presidential candidacy at the old state capitol in Springfield, where both he and Lincoln served in the legislature, he said, the life of the tall, gangly, self-made lawyer tells us that a different future is possible. He tells us that there is power in words. He tells us that there is power in hope. Having cast himself as Lincoln's heir during the campaign of 2008, Obama swore his oath of office on his hero's Bible. And during the two months between his election and taking up office, he studied Lincoln's presidential example. Asked by a CBS presenter which book apart from the Bible he would find essential in the Oval Office, he answered, team of rivals. Good Kurtz Goodwin's bestseller, subtitled The Political Genius of Abraham Lincoln. And the book shows how Lincoln surrounded himself with cabinet advisors, better educated and more experienced than he, who had run against him for his party's, for his party's nomination. With both presidents, uh, Lincoln and Obama, appointed their most potent rival as their Secretary of State. In uh, each case, the Senator from New York, uh, William Henry Seward and Hillary Clinton. Obama met Goodwin to discuss the lessons of Lincoln's leadership, his management of big egos, his emotional intelligence, his empathy for political opponents, his practicality, self-awareness, and humility. Early on, he made it clear that he wanted a bipartisan cast of his administration, telling his, translation, telling his transition team to bring in Republicans of all levels of government, not just as token appointments. Team of rivals? has become a term of art here, an Obama staffer explained. Obama cast the outgoing president, George W. Bush, as Lincoln's antithesis. Recalling a breakfast meeting at the White House with some other senators, Obama noted how, at one point, this was over the issue of judicial appointments, the president's eyes, President Bush's eyes, became fixed. His voice took on an agitated, rapid tone of someone's someone neither accustomed to nor welcoming interruption. His easy affability was replaced by an almost messianic certainty. But Bush, too, was a self-styled Lincolnian, who claimed the mantle of the 16th president for himself and ran for office as the leader of the party of Lincoln. In 2003, after the fall of Saddam Hussein, when he addressed US troops to declare mission accomplished, Bush staged managed the event on the aircraft carrier USS Lincoln. Subsequently, as it became increasingly clear that the Iraq mission was far from accomplished, and 
the slaughter took its human and political toll, Bush turned to Lincoln for consolation and inspiration. 43rd president found in the 16th another wartime president assailed from all sides, but still firm and unbending in defense of freedom. Lincoln's rhetoric of exceptionalism and faith in the universal truths of the Declaration of Independence gave Bush the means of declaring the war in Iraq a Lincolnian struggle. He found in Lincoln's use of military courts, suspension of the writ of habeas corpus, and other restrictions on civil liberties during the Civil War, a precedent for his own administration's draconian response to 9-11. Bush was confident that history would acquit him. During 2006, he read biographies of Lincoln, Churchill, and Truman. He took three books with him for his summer vacation on his Texas ranch, Thorfinnsville. Two of these were about Lincoln. One of them, rather embarrassingly, was mine. <laughs> he invited several Lincoln biographers, to be included, to informal meetings at the White House. I, I didn't go, which I earned enormous cachet uh, on both sides of the Atlantic. <laughs> that two leaders so contrasting in political temperament and program could take soccer from Lincoln tells us something about his protean and ambiguous character and points to the ambiguity and diversity of his legacy. Of course, all giant historical figures prompt contested interpretations, but Lincoln is particularly open to multiple readings. This most shut-mouthed man, as his law partner, William Herndon, described him, revealed little of himself, even to the closest of his associates. His merited reputation for telling the truth did not mean that he necessarily told the whole truth. And in political communication, he commonly chose to leave much unsaid. The absence of personal testimony, revealing personal testimony, contributes to the enigma. He kept no private journal, wrote no memoir. In consequence, Lincoln's compatriots, as well as, a gen as, well as generations of historians, have disputed the underlying motor of his politics and statecraft. Should his nationalism be extolled for its liberal values or damned for its coercive practice? anti-libertarianism, its encouragement of government? Was he a reluctant emancipator forced into glory, or a radical, a radical wolf in gradualist clothing? A racial progressive, or an instinctive white supremacist? A corporate railway lawyer, or a friend of the working man and the hard-handed son of toil? A pragmatic, or a visionary? a party political schema, or a principal statesman. Now these antitheses are deliberately overstated, and because they needn't be mutually exclusive, but the contested readings are real enough. Thus, each American generation has interpreted Lincoln anew, appropriating him across the political gamut. Progressives and conservatives, Democrats and Republicans, racial segregationists, who uh, cite his pre-war denial of political rights to blacks, and civil rights advocates who see in Lincoln's advocacy of votes for blacks a few days before his assassination the prompt for John Wilkes Booth's cruel bullet. A similar, though not equivalent, breadth of readings has characterized Lincoln's reputational legacy abroad. Given Lincoln's relative cultural invisibility, in Britain today, it's all too easy to underestimate the force of Lincoln's influence beyond his native land. After all, last year, 2009, belonged in Britain uh, not to Lincoln, but to a quite different bicentennial hero, one whose birthday he shared, Charles Darwin. According to a recent poll, Lincoln is a figure less recognizable to Britons than is Homer Simpson. <laughs> when anti-war crowds gathered in Parliament Square in 2003, crowd, uh, crews of workmen boxed in Lincoln's statue to protect it from possible attack. Do these people know nothing of history? One voice lamenting. Do they know nothing of what people like Lincoln stood for? Go back a century, however, and there existed what George Bernard Shaw called a cult of Lincoln. During the Civil War and its aftermath, when Britons and Americans sought to make the world safe for democracy, 
they seized on the Civil War president as a model of wise and noble.